time for prayer request. Remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Brother Gary and his help. Remember Brother Ann and Sister Barb. Remember Brother Chuck Sullivan and his help. Remember Brother Jim and Sister Judy. Remember Sister Linda Miller. Then take for a while. Remember Sister Ollie May and her help. Remember Sister Judy still need our prayers. Remember Jenny Witt and husband Larry. Linda Parks and we mentioned from stage four cancer. Remember Sister Barb Bird. Remember Sister Sandy's daughter Bo. Remember Chuck's friend Dakota family. Remember Brother James and Sister Jenny. Remember Brother Charlie and his friend Earl. Remember Linda Miller's son Andy needs our prayers. Remember Chris Carmichael's wife Vicky. The surgery was not successful. She is in a nursing home. Remember Lord's sister Linda. Remember Sister Diane and her family. Remember Lord's cousin Dwayne needs salvation. Remember the White's niece, Stormy needs salvation. Remember Sister Margaret and her bad children. Anybody else have a good call? That's the only one on my side. Sometimes having a good time uh, is better than, you know, 
being fulfilled in your mission of catching all kinds of fish and so forth. Uh, but uh, it, is, it is a wonderful thing when the Lord uh, answers your prayers or sometimes answers your prayer that you didn't even pray for. You just kind of thought about something that you kind of wanted God to take care of or you wished that it would happen this way and all of a sudden it does. And you really need to, I'm serious, you need to say thank you Lord because, you know, a lot of people don't really think of it this way, but he knows everything that is going on in all of our lives all the time. Our thoughts, our actions, our aspirations, our, our intentions, you know, in the, in the next couple of days. Um, the other day, we did the yard sale. The yard sale. We, I brought the little trailer over here, and I looked at it, and I thought, you know, I better put the sides on that trailer before we take the stuff up to the Salvation Army. Sister Judy, it was a good thing I put the sides on that trailer, because that dude was full. <laughs> it, was, it was packed full. I got back to the house, and I thought, you know, man, I'm just going leave to the, leave the sides on the trailer. They're on there. When I need to take them off, I'll take them off. Well, we got a phone call the other day. Hey, uh, is your trailer still there? Yeah. Can I borrow it? Yeah. Guess who needed the sides on the trailer? <laughs> who? It must be Pam. She's laughing. <laughs> She needed the sides on the trailer. See, I could have taken them off and you know, stashed them like I usually do. But it was just one of those things where the Lord said, and, and, and I didn't really understand that the Lord was saying, hey, Mom, I was just, you know, I just didn't feel like taking them off. And, uh, there they are. So, anybody else got a load you got to carry out of here? Uh, somebody else. Okay, you know, we'll just go on with the message. Um, <clears throat> last week, when we brought the message uh, for the church, we spoke about the great day which is coming. The great day when that eastern sky is going to open up. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And those of us who are alive and remain are going to be changed forever, Sister Glenn. Huh. Uh, I can never just say we're going to be changed either that. When I get to the part where I, I need to say, we're going to be changed, I, I, can, I can feel it. It's going to be good. It's going to be great. Oh, it's going to happen. Uh, my 25th birthday was a happy day. My 30th wasn't quite that good. But, uh, you know, we've had great days in our life. That's going to be the best day of your eternity, not your life. That's going to be the best day of your eternity. When you are changed, and you go to be with Jesus forever. Greatest possible thing that ever happened. But in the meantime, we have to put up with this world. We have to put up with how it is. Um, and at times, it's very problematic. And at times, this world is very troublesome. In our first song that we sang today, <clears throat> it tells us in three very short verses uh, just how well we do have it while we're here. Uh, the very first line says, I have found a friend in Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. What a wonderful thought. To have the greatest possible friend you could ever have. You know, I I was named after the White Eisenhower. I would love to have had the opportunity, Brother Bob, to have walked up and shook his hand and said, Thanks, Ike. Thanks for your name. Thanks for the good presidency that you had, that you gave us. Thanks for what you did in World War II. I would have thanked him for a lot of things. And I would have hoped to have him as a friend. But having the White Eisenhower as my friend, nothing compared having Jesus Christ as my friend. What the white could have done for me would have been great things. But Jesus Christ can do so much more, Brother Jim. Uh, and when we turn to Jesus uh, for salvation, we then become, and I'll use a term, 
we become righteous. Just like Abraham, when he believed the things God told him. You see, his belief of God and his belief in God is what took him from an unrighteous sinner to a righteous man in God's eyes. And that brought about this saying about Abraham. James 2.23 says, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What a blessing to be called a friend of God. Let's bow our heads. Our precious, most kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your blessings. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being able to call upon your name. We thank you, Father, for knowing that, like Abraham, we have that same blessing. And we are so glad that we can call Jesus our friend. We look in the Bible and we see Lazarus called out of the grave. We see the blind man, blind Bartimaeus, healed. He never had any idea truly what sight was all about. But he heard about it. And he wanted it. And thank God the last time he ever had a chance when Jesus was going out of Jericho for the last time. He called out to Jesus and he said give me my sight that I might see. He had no idea what it meant to see but he had heard about it. He heard it was good and he decided he wanted it. Salvation is the same way. We heard about it we decided we wanted it. We asked Jesus and we got it. It's so great to know that Jesus is our friend. In the same manner that he was Lazarus' friend. As the same manner that he was Bartimaeus' friend and so many others. And we thank you, Father, for that privilege. In Jesus' name, they all say. So as we sing... Um, when we, sing, when we sing, we find uh, we have found a friend in Jesus. We say also, by saying that, that we have become as righteous as Abraham. And I'd like to stop for just a minute here and talk about righteousness and salvation. There are people who believe that there are levels of righteousness and levels of salvation. And I want, I want to just straighten that out real quick here today. There's no such thing. You either are righteous or you are not. You are saved or you are not. It's an in, out, up, down, yes, no, perfect statement, one way or the other. Um, you know, the best example is yes, no. Um, Linda, did you wash your car this morning? No. See, that was easy. She didn't say, well, you know, kind of, almost, maybe, might have. No, she didn't. Anybody here throw a golf ball through your, one of your windows at home during the course of the week? See, it's up several heads that didn't move one way or the other. <laughs> now, of course, the answer is no. And it's, it's going to be that way. No, until somebody picks up a golf ball and throws it through the window. And then it will be yes. There's only one choice, one way or the other. Same way with righteousness and salvation. We, we look at Abraham and we think, what a wonderful man Abraham was. He was, I, I, absolutely. Like the white eyes, now, I, I would love to have had the chance to shake old Abraham's hand. Yes, sir, buddy. For a man, one of the first, the first one in the Bible ever to be called the friend of God, to be able to shake his hand, brother Jim? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just give me the chance to do that. Of course, he kind of died a few years before I came around, so I kind of took care of that problem. But uh, to know that I'm equal to Abraham as far as the eyes of God are concerned, as far as salvation and as far as righteousness, I'm equal to Abraham. I'm equal to Peter, James, John, Andrew, Paul, Philip, you name them. And you are too. That's the important part to understand. There's no level of salvation. 
we are saved or we are not. That's all there is to it. Degrees of salvation and degrees of righteousness do not exist. Now, the fact that a person, one person, might be a little bit easier to get along with, that's true. Might have a better personality, that's true. How many of you here know a Christian that has a lousy personality? Yeah, we all do. <laughs> there are Christians, they, you know, their personality is just, Ugh. man, that, that person needs to quit eating sauerkraut or something, you know, whatever it is. Makes them that way. They need to, they need to get a change. But they're still saved. They've got, got a lousy personality, but they're still saved. Uh, there's some people on television, uh, some preachers, you know. Uh, I don't know that they're not saved. They say that they are. I take their word for it. What they preach, I ain't got no use for. Uh, there's, there's a couple of them on there that says you name it and claim it, and God has to give it to you. I don't believe that. Uh, I hope they're saved. And, you know, uh, the people that comes to their church seems to believe that. If that's what it takes to keep them saved, well, praise God. I just don't believe it that way. That's all. But, again, degrees and levels of salvation, degrees and levels of righteousness, they don't exist. It's in or out, you are or you're not. But when we look at the protection that God gave unto Abraham, we realize that we have the same care, the same protection that's heaped upon us as Abraham had. Uh, and, the, and the reason for that is we have that exact same friendship that he had with God. And we also see that wonderful promise that God made to Abraham. I love this promise. And I've preached on this promise many times, and I will many times more, Brother Jim, but God allows me to stay down here. Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. Uh, and the thee, T-H-E-E, -E, that's in that particular verse up there, does not apply 100% particularly just to Abraham. It applies to him and all of his physical heirs and all of his spiritual heirs. If you're saved, if you have old-time salvation, you can raise your hand and you can say, that verse is mine. That verse belongs to me. And you can look around, and I'm sure you know people, that are friends with you. They have blessed you. They have helped you. They have done something for you. And you can look around and see what God has blessed them. It may not have been for you that they did something that God blessed them, but God is blessing them, and they're blessing you. Look at that. That's, that's this right here. There was a man... Years ago, he had a pretty good business, and he was doing well. He was trying to get bigger. He was trying to get better. He was talking to his employees, trying to find ways to add up, you know, get bigger, get better, make more money, uh, impress more people, help more people, and so forth. And somewhere, one of his conversations with one of the workers that he had the conversation turned to tithing. And the man told him, his boss, I tithe. His boss looked at him and said, what in the world are you talking about? He said, well, when I get my check, I look at my check and I see what I've been paid. I take 10% of that. I write that off. I give that to my church. He said, well, what do you do that for? Well, the church needs money. you got to pay for the electric bill. you got to pay for the water bill. Um, you got to pay for, you know, painting the walls. you got to pay for cleaning the carpet. Uh, you got to help people that are sick and dying. You know, we, you give them money and so forth. Uh, you got to help the pastor and this sort of stuff. He looked at him and he thought, well, I guess you're right. Yeah, you, you should. That's a lot of money to give to church. He said, well, I do. Well, this boss thought about it. He didn't really pray about it because he was lost. But he thought about it. He gave it some consideration. And a couple of weeks later, he thought, you know, I'm going to try this. Because if I'm giving some of my money to a church, I'm 
blessing the church. I'm going to see if God will bless me. So he started it. About two years later, instead of giving 10%, he was so happy and been so well blessed that he moved it to 20%. And then 30. He got to the point, now we're not talking about the money of the whole business. We're talking about what the money that the boss took home. The money that he took home, he was giving 90% of that, spreading it across to different churches. Has anybody ever heard this story? Do you know who I'm talking about? J.C. Penny is the man. His employee came in one day, and they got to talking about it. His employee told him, he said, you know, Mr. Penny, you, you're, you're missing one thing. He said, what's that? God's been blessing me greatly. He said, yeah, but you haven't done the last step. What's the last step? You need to get saved. <laughs> and there in his office, they took hands. He prayed over Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny got saved. God bless him. <laughs> I heard that story years ago. I, I had to laugh about it. I laugh about it now. I am just so... You know, it blesses me to think how God blessed him. How many of you shopped at a J.C. Penney store? You know, we all have. I mean, personally, um, of all the stores Mom used to go to in Columbus, that was my favorite. I could always find clothing that I liked in there. I could you know, always seem to be at a price I could afford. Uh, that wasn't true with Lazarus. That wasn't true with Boston store. That wasn't true with Sears. A whole bunch of other places in J.C. Penney, I could find stuff. I was really unhappy when J.C. Penney, you know, Mr. Penny is long gone. It's being run by other people. Well, you know what happens when other people run your business. It doesn't work out as good. But um, he read that blessing, or he read that verse. He took it to heart and became a wonderful Christian. But in making that promise, God said, because we are the spiritual promise, that promise from God is ours as well. Claim it. Live it. Give others a reason to help you and bless you. God will bless them. If they get to the point where they see God is blessing them, they'll get saved. Possibly. If they never see that God is blessing them, there's a, there's a ch good chance they never will get saved. They need something to draw them unto God. I, uh, I heard a preacher say one time that if somebody would come and get saved that night, it would be the best Christmas gift he ever got. I heard that that night, and Sister Pam, I went. He didn't get the best Christmas gift, but I did. I realized that night, sitting there in that little pew, 21 hours there, I realized what a gift salvation was that night. God gave me the understanding that there was something that I could get that I really would, I could use. And that was old time salvation. Uh, Mom was so happy it wasn't funny when I told her. Uh, my grandmother laughed and cried to the point in the old nursing home, she clapped her hands, laughed, and cried to the point she went to sleep. Wore her out, just rejoicing. I got my coat on, I got ready to leave. And I started to walk over, I was just going to kiss her on the forehead and leave. She woke back up, just right back to it, clapping her hands, and praising the Lord, didn't miss a stroke. She slept for 20 minutes, didn't miss me. <laughs> but God gives us a reason, one way or another, that we need to get saved. He tells us. He gives us the opportunity. He tells us. Um, and that's what happened to, with Mr. Penny. That's what happened with me. And I've heard the, the conversation of so many other people. There was something there that drew them. They realized there was something that they needed, something God could give them, and they decided they wanted it, and they got it. But speaking of friendship, God inspired Solomon to write about true friendship. And Solomon wrote it this way. He said, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born.
form for adversity. A true friend, a true friend will love you always, and that true friend will love you more than an actual brother, who will often be one who is causing trouble. How many of you have heard the story of John Henry dying and the children fighting over what's left over? Fighting for the house, fighting for the car, fighting for the bank account, fighting for the insurance money. All of a sudden, those brothers and sisters don't seem to be brothers and sisters anymore, Brother Jim. They seem to be some of the worst fighting people you ever saw. But yet, let me tell you something. And I can say, Brother Bob can tell you this personally. Brother Jim can probably tell you, and I can tell you too. The greatest friend you'll ever have is the friend that's with you in battle. The friend that is with you in adversity. The friend that is with you in trouble. It's the greatest friend you'll ever have. When we walked through Vietnam, arms in hand, when Brother Bob walked through Korea, arms in hand, the best friend he had was the guy on his right hand side, the guy on his left hand side, because either one of them would give their life to save Brother Bob. A good friend like that is the greatest friend you will 